Welcome to lesson number one, titled The War Behind All Wars, ready for teaching on April 6. The author of this series of lessons on the Great Controversy is Mark Finley, and your reader today is Percy Harold. And here is the introduction to this quarter's series of lessons written by Mark Finley. It's titled The Great Controversy. If asked what central theme runs through all the Bible, how would you respond? Jesus? The plan of salvation? The cross? Yes, all three, of course. But these three important topics unfold against an even more all-encompassing theme, the great controversy. This theme pervades the Bible from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. The great controversy began in heaven with Lucifer's rebellion against God. At the heart of this cosmic conflict is the issue of God's love. Is he fully loving? Does he have the best interests of his creatures in view? Or is he an authoritative dictator, desiring only what is in his own self-interest? This quarter's lessons trace world history from God's viewpoint as prophecy reveals it, from the time of Christ down through the centuries to our day and beyond. God's very nature is love, and therefore all his acts are loving, though this fact may not always be evident to finite human beings or even angels. But God's love is progressively revealed as the great controversy unfolds. We see its height and depth most clearly through the cross. At Calvary, God's love was displayed before the entire universe when Christ poured out his life to redeem humanity and Satan's ultimate defeat was assured. Yet the battle rages on. Satan tried to destroy Jesus on the cross and through the centuries we see him trying to destroy God's people. Although Satan has viciously persecuted Christ's church and slaughtered millions, God has always been present with his people and will never leave them. This quarter will trace the major developments in the great controversy beginning with the rebellion in heaven. We will explore the central issues of the conflict between Christ and and Satan. We will see the indomitable courage of the Waldenses despite fierce persecution and the determination of the reformers to follow Bible truth even in the face of torture, chains, the stake and martyrdom. Commenting on the faith of these spiritual giants, Ellen G. White states in The Great Controversy, page 249, The Bible was their authority, and by its teaching they tested all doctrines and all claims. Faith in God and His Word sustained these holy men as they yielded up their lives at the stake. End of quote. The Reformation kindled a torch of truth that still burns brightly. The Reformers' bedrock faith in Scripture and their steadfast assurance of salvation by grace through faith paved the way for the rise of the Advent movement, championed by William Miller and a host of others around the world. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was raised up by God to build on the foundation laid by the Reformers in order to restore biblical truths that had been lost sight of through the centuries. Central to its mission is proclaiming the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. God's final warning to the world, soon to come to an end. This proclamation arouses the wrath of Satan, pictured as a dragon by the Apostle John. In Revelation 12.17, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We will also study the final events in the Great Controversy, including the triumph of God's love over all the principalities and powers of hell that ushers in the creation of new heavens and a new earth. Though the basis of this quarter's lesson is the Bible, we will use the book The Great Controversy by Ellen G. White as our thematic outline in studying this tremendous topic. 
The chapters on which each lesson is based are noted to facilitate its use as a companion book for further study and sharing that we all might more fully know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, as we read in Ephesians 3.19. A native of Connecticut, USA, Mark Finley, an internationally known evangelist, was a vice president of the General Conference from 2005 to 2010. After retiring from full-time employment, he became an assistant to the president of the General Conference. Pastor Finley and his wife Ernestine have three children and five grandchildren. Sabbath afternoon, March 30. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are about to open your word again on a whole new series of lessons for this quarter. And as we do so, we know that some things will be uncomfortable, some things will bring us joy, and some things will encourage us to serve you more faithfully. And as we open your word today, we pray that you will be with each one of us. May your Holy Spirit guide us as we open your word, that we may see the joy and the benefit of us knowing what you want us to know. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to make the choices that we need to make this week as we follow your word. And today I'd also like to pray for those who are on the front line in the war against evil uh, that is expressed in so many ways, like real live missionaries in frontline service and local church members witnessing in their family and their communities. And Lord, I'd also like to pray for those who are suffering because of war and famine and neglect and abuse in just so many areas in this sin-sick world. Lord, we just thank you that we can come to your word and find hope and grace in time of need. And I'd particularly also like to pray for Thelma Ray in the Virgin Islands, for the country of Guyana and Venezuela who have difficulties together, Lord, and there are members of our church, there are Christians in both those countries who need help and guidance. And Brian and Alexandra Beavers in Richmond in Virginia, Lord, I'd pray for them and for Cheryl Nadine Blair and her family and Claire Lewis and her family as well and Josiah and Pompilou and Joe Pert and Mavis Allen in her grief in Fremont, Freeport in Bahamas. Lord, wherever our need is, we know that we can come to you and today I'd particularly like to pray for these people. Now bless us, we pray in Jesus' name as we open your word. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? How can a God of love allow so much evil to exist? Why do bad things happen to good people? In this week's lesson, we will explore the age-long conflict between good and evil. Beginning with Lucifer's rebellion in heaven, we will examine the origin of evil and God's long suffering in dealing with the sin problem. God is a God of incredible love. His very nature is love, as we read in 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. 
All of his actions are loving. We read in Jeremiah 31 verse 3, The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Love can never be forced, coerced or legislated. Ellen G. White states it well when she writes, Only by love is love awakened. And that comes from The Desire of Ages, page 22. To deny the power of choice is to destroy the ability to love. And to destroy the ability to love is to eradicate the possibility of being truly happy. God wins our allegiance by his love. He is dealing with the great controversy between good and evil in such a way that sin will never arise in the universe again. God's purpose is to demonstrate before the entire universe that he has already acted in the best interests of his creatures. Looking at the world through the lens of God's love, in the light of the great controversy between good and evil, reassures each of us that right will triumph over wrong and will do so forever. And this week's study is based on the great controversy, chapters 29 to 30, in preparation for teaching this lesson on Sabbath, April 6. Sunday, March 31, War in Heaven. Read Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. What does this passage reveal about the freedom existing in heaven and the origin of evil? When Lucifer rebelled, in what ways could God have responded? Revelation 12, beginning at verse 7. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. These verses describe a cosmic conflict between good and evil. Satan and his angels warred against Christ and eventually were cast out of heaven. It seems extremely strange that war would break out in such a perfect place as heaven. Why did it occur? Did a loving God create a demonic angel who initiated this war? Was there some fatal flaw in this angel that led him to rebel? The Bible clearly explains the origin of evil. It draws the curtain aside in this conflict between good and evil. Compare Ezekiel 28 verses 12 to 15 and Isaiah 14 verses 12 to 14. What went on in the mind of this angelic being called Lucifer that led to his rebellion. First of all, Ezekiel 28, beginning at verse 12. Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre, and say to him, This is what the sovereign Lord says. You, with a seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, carnelian, chrysolite and emerald, topaz, onyx and jasper, lapis, lazuli, turquoise and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. And Isaiah 14 verses 12 to 14. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. 
I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. God did not create a devil. He created a being of dazzling brightness named Lucifer. This angelic being was created perfect. Included in his perfection was freedom of choice, a fundamental principle of God's government, which runs by love, not coercion. Sin originated with Lucifer in heaven itself. There is no logical explanation why this perfect angel should have allowed pride and jealousy to take root in his heart and grow into rebellion against his creator. Lucifer, a created being, desired the worship that belongs only to the creator. He attempted to usurp God's throne by questioning God's authority. His rebellion led to open warfare in heaven. Although God bore long with Lucifer, he could not allow him to spoil heaven with his rebellion. The heavenly councils pleaded with Lucifer, we read in the Great Controversy, page 494 to 495. The Son of God presented before him the greatness, the goodness and the justice of the Creator and the sacred unchanging nature of his law. God himself had established the order of heaven, and in departing from it, Lucifer would dishonour his maker and bring ruin upon himself. But the warning given in infinite love and mercy only aroused a spirit of resistance. End of quote. And so to finish the day, what lessons can you draw about God's character in his dealing with evil? Monday, April 1. Lucifer deceives, Christ prevails. There is no logical explanation for why Lucifer, this perfect angel, should have allowed pride and jealousy to take root in his heart and grow into rebellion against his creator. Satan's pride ripened into open rebellion. He accused God of being unjust and unfair. He infected the angels with his doubts and accusations. Read Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4. What does this passage reveal about Satan's ability to deceive how many of the angels fell for his lies about God? Revelation 12 verse 4. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. When war broke out in heaven, the angels had to decide, would they follow Jesus or Lucifer? What was the nature of this war in heaven? Was it a physical war or a war of ideas or both? We don't know the details, but the conflict was physical enough that Satan and his angels eventually were cast out and a place was not found for them in heaven any longer, as it said in Revelation 12 verses 8 and 9. This war obviously includes some kind of physical element. One thing is certain about the war in heaven, every angel had to decide for or against Christ. Whom would they follow? Whose voice would they listen to? The loyal angels chose to be obedient to Christ's loving commands, while one third of the angels listened to the voice of Lucifer, disobeyed God, and lost heaven. We too, in this critical time of Earth's history, are called to decide for or against Christ. We too are to declare whose side we are on, Christ's or Satan's. Read Revelation chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, Exodus 32, verse 26, Joshua 24, verse 15, 1 Kings 18, 20 and 21, and Revelation 22, verse 17. What fundamental principle in the great controversy do these verses teach us? First of all, Genesis 2, verses 15 to 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. 
you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And Exodus 32 verse 26, So he stood at the entrance to the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. And Joshua 24 verse 15, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served before on the Euphrates, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you were living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And First Kings 18, verses 20 to 21. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. And Revelation 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. When God created humanity, He embedded deep within our brains the ability to think, to reason, and to choose. The essence of our humanness is our ability to make moral choices. We are not mere robots. We were created in God's image, distinct from the animal creation, in our ability to make moral choices and live by eternal spiritual principles. After Lucifer's rebellion in heaven, and after the fall, God has called his people to respond to his love and to be obedient to his commands by choosing to serve him. And so to finish today, what lessons can we learn from the battle in heaven that relates to our own personal battle with sin? If Satan was able to deceive these righteous, holy, heavenly beings, what does this say about his evil attempts to deceive us? Tuesday, April 2, Planet Earth Becomes Involved. When God created the Earth, He created it perfect. The Bible says that He saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was very good in Genesis 1.31. There was no stain of sin or evil anywhere. But He gave Adam and Eve the same freedom of choice He had given to Lucifer. He didn't want robots on Earth any more than He wanted robots in Heaven. In fact, he went out of his way to make this freedom clear. He planted a tree in the garden and called it the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He made a point of telling Adam and Eve about it because he wanted to make sure they knew they had a choice. Satan came to the tree and as Eve lingered there, he told her, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God and know good and evil. Genesis 3, 4 and 5. In other words, if you eat of this tree, you will enter a new sphere of existence. You will have excitement. You will have a thrill that you've never known before. Eve, God is keeping something from you. Here, take the forbidden fruit and eat it. When Eve and later Adam made that choice, they opened a door that God wanted to keep forever closed. It was the doorway to sin, the doorway to suffering, heartache, sickness and death. Read Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, Romans 3.23 and Romans 5.12. What do these texts have in common? describe the ultimate results of sin that plague the entire human race. Genesis 3, beginning at verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, 
But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. And Romans 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. At its very core, sin is rebellion against God. Sin separates us from God. Since God is the source of life, separation from God leads to death. It also leads to worry, anxiety, sickness and disease. The suffering in our world is ultimately the result of living in a sin-ravaged planet. This certainly does not mean that every time we suffer we have sinned. It does mean that every one of us is affected by living on this planet. And so to finish today, read Genesis 3.15, Leviticus 5, verses 5 and 6, and John 1.29. What promise did God give Adam and Eve in the garden after they sinned that would give them hope in their despair? What service did God initiate in Eden that would point them forward through the centuries, to the solution to the sin problem. Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. And Leviticus 5, verses 5 and 6, When anyone becomes aware that they are guilty in any of these matters, they must confess in what way they have sinned. As a penalty for the sin they have committed, they must bring to the Lord a female lamb or goat from the flock as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for them for their sin. And John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wednesday, April 3, Love Finds a Way Adam and Eve have sinned, and God has told them that they must leave their garden home. From now on, toil and suffering will be their lot. Will they have to suffer and finally die with no hope? Is death the end of everything? It was at this point that God gave them the promise recorded in Genesis 3.15. Looking directly at Satan, the serpent, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. They may not have fully understood at that moment exactly what this meant, but they knew they could hope again. In some way, through the seed of the woman, their redemption would come. The seed of the woman, of course, is Jesus Christ, as we read in Galatians 3.16. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. At the cross, Satan bruised his heel. But Jesus' victory is our guarantee that one day the serpent's head will be crushed. The door of suffering and death that Adam and Eve opened will one day be closed. Read Hebrews 2 verse 9, Galatians 3.13, 2 Corinthians 5.21. What do these verses tell us about the immensity of Christ's sacrifice on the cross? First of all, Hebrews 2, verse 9. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honour because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. And Galatians 3, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become 
the righteousness of God. Do you ever wonder if God really loves you? Look at the cross. Look at the crown of thorns. Look at the nails in his hands and feet. With every drop of blood that Jesus shed on Calvary, God is saying, I love you. I do not want to be in heaven without you. Yes, you've sinned and sold yourself into the hand of the enemy. Yes, in and of yourself you are unworthy of eternal life. But I've paid the ransom to get you back. When you look at the cross, you never have to wonder again if you're loved. The Bible speaks of Jesus who came to this world and experienced heartache, disappointment and pain in common with all humanity. It reveals a Christ who faced the same temptations we faced. A Christ who triumphed over the principalities and powers of hell both in his life and through his death on the cross. All for each one of us personally. Think about it. Jesus, the one who created the cosmos, as you read in John 1 verse 3, stepped down from heaven and not only came into this fallen world, but suffered in it in ways none of us ever will, as you read in Isaiah 53, 1-5. But first, John 1 verse 3, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And Isaiah 53, beginning at verse 1, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. And he did it because he loved us, each of us. What a powerful reason to hope. And so to finish today, how did Christ answer Satan's charges on the cross? In the light of the great controversy between good and evil, what did his death accomplish? And although my role is just to read the text of the Sabbath school pamphlet and the Bible verses, I must tell you that this day's lesson is one of the most exciting and satisfying and enlightening days that I've ever read for those who listen. May God bless you and may you see the joy and the hope in today's lesson. Thursday, April 4, Our High Priest what Jesus did for us on the cross enables him also to intercede for us in heaven. Our resurrected Lord is our great high priest, providing everything we need to be saved and to live in God's kingdom forever. Read Hebrews 4 verses 15 to 16 and chapter 7 verse 25. How do these verses give us assurance in a world of temptation, suffering, disease and death? First of all, Hebrews 4, beginning at verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. 
The text says that he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin in Hebrews 4.15, and it adds, Let us therefore come boldly, that means confidently, to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need in verse 16. To state it very simply, Jesus presents us before the universe as clothed in his righteousness, saved by his death and redeemed through his blood. Everything we should have been, he was. In Christ there is no condemnation for the sins of our past. In Christ our guilt is gone and through his mighty intercession the grip of sin on our lives is broken. The chains that bind us are loosed and we are free. Read John 17 verses 24 to 26. What is Christ's longing desire in the great controversy between good and evil? John 17, beginning at verse 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. Writing in The Great Controversy, pages 501 and 502, Ellen White says... When the great sacrifice had been consummated, Christ ascended on high, refusing the adoration of angels until he had presented the request, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, John 17, 24. Then with inexpressible love and power came forth the answer from the Father's throne. Let all the angels of God worship him, Hebrews 1 verse 6. Not a stain rested upon Jesus, his humiliation. To him a name that is above every name, end of quote. Jesus wants more than anything else for us to be with him in heaven. The desire of his heart, the reason for his death and intercession is to save us. Do you have a special need in your life? Tell it to Jesus. Where there is sorrow, he brings comfort. Where there is fear, he brings peace. Where there is guilt, he brings forgiveness. Where there is weakness, he brings strength. And so to finish today, why do you think Christ sacrificed himself for us? What makes us so valuable to him? Friday, April 5, Further Thought From the book The Great Controversy, page 500 to 501, we read, In the banishment of Satan from heaven, God declared his justice and maintained the honour of his throne. But, when man had sinned through yielding to the deceptions of this apostate spirit, God gave an evidence of his love by yielding up his only begotten son to die for the fallen race. In the atonement, the character of God is revealed. The mighty argument of the cross demonstrates to the whole universe that the course of sin which Lucifer had chosen was in no wise chargeable upon the government of God. End of quote. And then on page 503 we read, The cross of Calvary, while it declares the law immutable, proclaims to the universe that the wages of sin is death. In the Saviour's expiring cry, it is finished, the death knell of Satan was rung. The great controversy which had been so long in progress was then decided, and the final eradication of evil was made certain. The Son of God passed through the portals of the tomb, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, 
that is the devil. Hebrews 2, verse 14, end of quote. And that brings us to our discussion questions for this week. One, if God knew that Lucifer was going to rebel, why did he give him the power of choice in the first place? Or when Lucifer rebelled, why didn't God just annihilate him immediately? What kind of reaction might the unfallen universe have had if God had immediately wiped Lucifer out? Why is the concept of the universe's interest in the plan of salvation so important to understanding the great controversy? And we're referred to three passages of Scripture here. The first is 1 Peter 1 verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. And Revelation 5 verse 13 then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. And Revelation 16 verse 7. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Question 2. What reason, or reasons, can you think of for Christ's death on the cross? Was it only to reveal the character of God? Was it to pay the ransom price for sin? If so, to whom was the ransom paid? Share your thoughts and give biblical reasons for them. And question three, when we use the term the great controversy, what do we mean? Discuss the various aspects of the great controversy and how this week's lesson applies to your own life. And question four, what Bible texts talk about the reality of the great controversy? And we referred here to a couple. We've referred first to Job chapter one. And let's start at verse six. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And then we go to the start of chapter 2 of Job. On another day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil, and he maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his life, but now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. 
Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. And Ephesians 6.12 For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And then question 5. How is the Seventh-day Adventist understanding unique among other Christian denominations? What is it in this great controversy theme that sets Adventists apart? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Volcano, Fires and COVID-19 by Andrew McChesney Cuban missionary Michel Delgado Rodriguez faced a major challenge on his first Sabbath in the Canary Islands. Only five people came to worship. Michel dove into mission outreach work, visiting former church members and others on La Palma Island. A month later, he rejoiced with the first baptism, but then COVID-19 suspended outreach efforts and his problems seemed to multiply. A fire broke out in the north of the island, leaving some members without homes. Then a fire broke out in the south. Then a volcano erupted for 85 days, leaving islanders grappling with earthquakes, toxic gas and ashes. Two church families lost everything. Amid the storms, something amazing happened. Faith blossomed. Three years after Michelle's arrival, 45 people were regularly worshipping on Sabbath. In addition, seven people had been baptised, five were preparing for baptism, and 15 taking Bible studies. What happened? Michelle said intercessory prayer was key. We pray every day at 7am, 2pm and 9pm, he said. Each member prays for five people. Each church department also embraced practical evangelism. One project, an initiative of the Spanish Union of Churches Conference, saw church members calling contacts over the phone and offering Ellen White's Steps to Christ and related Bible studies. Other projects included educational courses on the church's Facebook page aimed at the needs of families, young people and little children. Musical evangelism in which Adventist young people held mini concerts on the street or while visiting the sick and needy. A program with ADRA in which members handed out cards that could be presented for food in supermarkets, health presentations, Bible studies and the distribution of the Desire of Ages and other books. On holidays, such as Mother's Day, church members placed a special card inside each book. The church also opened a discipleship school where lay people could learn how to evangelise and four small groups were meeting regularly in homes. Friendship evangelism has proven very successful, Michal said. While the volcano was erupting, church members spent two months passing out masks and literature with health information related to volcanoes. That way the church became well known, Michal said. Indeed, many of the 15 people taking Bible studies lost everything in the volcano and they have acknowledged that the crisis led them to God, he said. Otherwise, they would not have been interested in learning about God, he said. Michelle looks back at his experience in the Canary Islands with joy. The beginning was very difficult, he said. We have been through a lot, but the results are very satisfying. We have seen how God has blessed us. Thank you for your help to spread the gospel in the Canary Islands and around the world.